Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Bitter, and today I have a solo episode for you. Today's solo episode is going to be a bit of a recap on my training or preparation for the Havilene 100, which when this episode comes out will be probably just a little under a week or so from the start of the race. So I thought it'd be a good time just to do a recap kind of on just everything that went into the preparation for it. And one of the reasons why I'm excited to do it for this particular race versus some of the prior race uh, reflection, race training reflections is because in the buildup for this particular 100 miler, I released a bunch of episodes just on uh, training and uh, a lot of times they were focused on kind of simplifying it or putting it in a perspective where people could have a really good starting point or a really good assessment point to kind of find out if they are more or less heading in the right direction or planning their order of operations, so to speak, properly and just thinking about the right things when it comes to programming training and preparing for races, whether it be something like I'm doing 100 mile distance or even more standard distances like 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons, or what I call Olympic distance events. So this one is also a little bit more exciting to reflect on because in the last couple of years, I've just had more issues with injuries than I had historically had in my career. So there's been a little bit of a variance kind of in how my buildups have gone relative to what I was able to maybe do at times in the past when I was compounding really solid training blocks on top of one another. And this one just felt a little different in terms like I felt like I kind of had that same level of momentum or maybe you could call it success rate in the training execution. So I'm excited to test it out. You know, it's a hundred mile distance. So like I say, it's, you know, anyone's guess how that's going to end up going at the end of the day, because there's a lot that can and will happen over the course of that day. But I'm, I'm much more confident, I think, in my training and fitness right now than I have been in a while. And uh, some of that I think is going to be evident in kind of the report that I give here, but also probably to, to some degree anyway, you know, Nicole and I have been in Austin now for coming up on two years, actually, and January will be our second official year in Austin. And you know, it's like anything in life when you have bigger changes and things like that. I do think there is at least a low level of just stress that comes along with trying to get yourself efficient the way you probably were in the past. And Nicole and I, we'd lived in Phoenix for four years prior to that. So by the time we moved, I had very much had my routine and everything set up pretty, pretty streamlined in Phoenix. So Austin was a change. It was a welcomed one, uh, a lot of opportunities, which also kind of adds to it too, when you're, you know, pursuing new things and different things too, it's always a little bit of a guess as to how that's going to impact things. So who knows how much of a role that actually played or not. It's definitely something that I've thought about or considered, but needless to say, I'm excited to kind of report on this training block and uh, hopeful for what it will produce for me on the 28th when I race the Havilene 100. Also, just a quick reminder that I do have a show raffle option where I raffle off a 30-minute consultation with me every month. The way to enter that is just to share a show or episode on social media. So you find an episode you like, share it with your friends and followers, tag me so I know you did it. That enters you in the raffle, and I will announce those at the start of each month. You can share multiple episodes and get entered more than once if you want. It is just an initiative I've been doing to give back in terms of the listeners who are out there spreading the word and it does go a long way when people like subscribe com or comment to some degree yes uh, but give show reviews and then share episodes so it gets spread to a wider audience if you do want to support the show in other means i do have a show patreon page and support sh- options on the show landing page which is just zachbitter.com forward slash hpo The show Patreon page does give you access to early release episodes. So like this particular episode has been up there for about a week and a half now. And it also is ad free right to the point. So if you subscribe on Patreon, you get those accesses and uh, can jump right into the topic. Supporting this podcast this year have been my friends at Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. I have full descriptions of how I use both of these products. I've been partnering with them because I do use both of them in my own training and racing. So if you're interested in getting into the weeds a little bit more about how I actually use these products to maybe sense out whether they'd be a useful tool for you personally. At the very end of the show, I've got more thorough descriptions of each of those. For now, just a couple quick announcements about them and 
in regards to what their promotions they're running at the moment. Element has right now a promotion where they're letting you try out a free sample pack of each of their flavors. Those include citrus, watermelon, orange, grapefruit, raspberry, chocolate, mango, chili, raw, unflavored. If you go to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO, that lets them know you came from here and gets you that free sample pack with your first purchase. They also have no questions asked return policy. So if you get them, decide you don't like them or they're not as advertised the way you thought they would be, they will give you your money back. No questions asked. Don't even have to send the box back. Delta G ketones is something I've been using this year. I've been following the exogenous ketone research for quite some time now, including a few years ago when I had Dr. Brianna Stubbs on. It's gotten to the point where I've uh, found it to be something I'm worth. I find worthwhile putting it in my training and racing. So they have uh, a ton of research on their website at deltagketones.com where they have 50 plus published studies and 20 plus ongoing studies and they also will do a free consultation with you if you're interested in how that would maybe apply to your lifestyle versus kind of how i'm using them so again feel free to jump to the end of the episode or wait to the end of the episode to hear how i use that in my own training and racing protocol it's deltagketones.com Links to both of these sponsors will be in the show notes as well as the show landing page. There's a couple things that maybe consider checking out if you're really interested in this particular report or you want to do some follow-up stuff is I kind of came into this block in a really interesting situation. And to be honest, one that didn't produce a lot of optimism. Uh, I, I had an injury, actually. I, was, uh, I dealt with a right sacral stress fracture in the early part of the summer. So it basically took me off of running for the entirety of May. I got the injury right at the end of April as I was basically putting the final touches on uh, a race that I had was planning for June. So I was actually fairly optimistic about that buildup though. It was one of the buildups that I've had uh, that I thought went pretty decently. I had some hiccups in it in terms of just some things that didn't quite feel right. But generally speaking, it felt like an improvement upon what I had done the prior year. So to me at the time, I thought of that as a step in the right direction and uh, a reason for optimism. But then, yeah, when I was met with that sacral stress fracture, that obviously kind of crushed a lot of that. And then it also brought in a lot of uncertainty in my mind as to kind of how things were going to go once I was able to start training again and what that timeline would actually end up being going into Javelina, so, or look like going into Javelina. So if you are interested in that, I have a podcast episode that talks about uh, just kind of how I navigated and what I learned during that time when I was dealing with that sacral stress fracture and some of the stuff that I did to help get through that. So if you are, that's episode 359, Recovering from Sacral Stress Fracture. I actually dove into that one a little bit more holistically with that particular injury, partly because I had a little bit of an interesting situation with it being that I've had no bone issues in my life from a broken bone stress factor standpoint, other than my right sacral ala, which is essentially your tailbone. Because I've had to stress fracture on that twice now. So I had it in 2017 and then this year. So to me, that was reason enough for a little bit of extra digging as to maybe what was going on there. And I went down like a bunch of different pathways to confirm things like, was it nutritionally based? Was it something that I need to be considering from a training programming standpoint that is specific to me having issues with that particular spot? And digging through all that stuff, I I had a lot of optimism in the sense that like it was pretty clear to me that it wasn't something that I was doing nutritionally wrong. The bone scans and and blood work and stuff I got all came back saying that I was heading in the right direction with that stuff. And uh you know, the thing that really did stand out was it appeared I had some mechanical issues that likely were resulting in that particular area, taking on a little more load than it was able to tolerate, especially when I would get to kind of like a peaking phase of a a training block. So um, that is where I kind of really spearheaded a lot of the tension. And that brought in the mobility routine that I started incorporating uh, to really kind of help try to like clear up some of that. So there's uh i I talk about the mobility routine a bit too on that podcast episode 359 but if you're interested in some of the specifics to it i do have an instagram reel post where i go over some of the movements that i've been doing in that it's very much an evolving routine though it's one thing i really learned that process was that mobility isn't really something that you just kind of do to get through a workout or to warm up for a workout it's really something that you just apply 
specifically to like areas that are going to be unique to you to some degree and consistency within that is what really yields the results. And what I mean by that is like, if I'm consistent with the mobility routine that was kind of built around the things that I needed to work on, which happened to be ankle, hip and shoulder, it didn't really matter when I did it. If I just did it, I would go out for a run and feel just noticeably better. So that was uh, kind of a, a key point of the early stage of this training block was really getting that part of the routine and being able to see some of those results show up in my runs when I did get back to running. But all in all, my, my base building phase for Javelina actually technically started while I was still not running. So the reality with a sacral stress fracture, or at least the way mine was and behaved, is I could do a fair bit of training. I just couldn't do like weight bearing type stuff where it would be impact driven like running. So I had options to bike and I had some options to do some strength work and some sled pushing and pulling, which are the areas that I really leaned into. So during those last couple of weeks where I was still off from running, I was putting in a fair bit of training. Actually, I did quite a bit of biking, quite a bit of sled pushing and pulling and a, a decent amount of strength work. And really the, the way I was gauging things with that was like if it didn't bother anything or I didn't feel any weird discomfort from the activity and it didn't behave in a way where like I would wake up the next day and it would be worse than the fact that the, the next day it was at a point where I was having no discomfort with it and really I was just waiting for a timeline to start running. When you look at bone remodeling, we were looking at like a four to six week window. So there was just no way I was even going to attempt to run until I hit at least four weeks. So that was something I was going to be very, very firm on. And I just had an opportunity before I hit that four weeks to do some other stuff that weren't, weren't bothering it and may have actually helped because it may have helped strengthen the areas around that area that could potentially be helpful in keeping that area from taking on so much load to the point where the bone actually has a, starts to fracture. Um, yeah. So, I mean, in a, in a couple of weeks before I started running, I was actually putting in pretty solid training sessions. Like I was up to like 20 hours a week in some cases. And a lot of that was like a lot of zone two biking and sled pushing. Uh, I did start phasing in some assault bike work because I did feel like my, my efficiency with the biking and the sled pushing and the zone two zone one stuff was, was quite high. I didn't feel like it was something where it was, uh, it was suffering and that I had to kind of just stick to that as the primary focus. So I actually started introducing some assault bike based like zone four, zone five type workouts. And I structured them fairly similar to I would running workouts where with short intervals, I'd use a one to one work to rest ratio and longer intervals. I'd use a two to one work to rest ratio. The one difference I did is I really shortened them. So for the short intervals, I was doing things like 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. And for the long intervals, I was doing a little shorter than I normally would. Usually my shortest long interval is about eight minutes in training. So for this, I was doing sometimes five or six minute ones. So they were basically lactate threshold type tempo type effort workouts, but I was working with a little bit of a shorter window of time with those. Um, just uh, out of curiosity and to some degree it just seemed more palatable for me to do it that way on the assault bike versus on running where I think I would actually prefer the long intervals to you know stretch out a little bit versus being being too short um yeah so I mean I wasn't certain exactly how that would translate to running specific fitness especially the running that would be a little more flat and consistent versus like a steeper trail. I think a lot of times some of these cross training type activities probably feed in a little better to very trained courses, especially if they have like really steep climbs, just because you're going to be more mechanically similar and there's going to be a little more power based with that stuff. So I think you can, you can replicate that a little better on a bike or by pushing and pulling a sled. But for me personally, it's possible that those activities were helpful in terms of both maintaining fitness and creating some balances in areas that were maybe previously imbalanced. And I, I say that because when I came back to running, I was pretty shocked at how quickly I saw improvements. And it seemed like a lot of it was just kind of getting back into running to the point where I was used to the impact of it versus feeling like I had a lot of fitness to to regain or anything like that, which which sort of makes sense. I was I got injured at the back end of a buildup. So I carried in a lot of fitness into that injury and then 
really when I was able to start cross training, I had only taken maybe two to three weeks off total. So it's not that likely that I was really losing a ton of fitness, certainly not at like the zone one, zone two, like that lower intensity type uh, ranges. So perhaps I was maybe a little over concerned from a skepticism standpoint heading into the training block. But all in all, my my uh, thought process along the way was I was very happy and excited about the the rate at which I was progressing through that one. So it was a situation in which when I did kind of start the official build back to running, I got back up to a decent amount of volume uh, in, in a couple of weeks to the point where I felt comfortable not just going out for a run and paying attention to okay, is this going to be damaging or potentially problematic in terms of having a setback with that particular injury to let's add a little more structure and a little more focus and start measuring some of these running related uh, metrics. So I went into what I would traditionally do for a base building phase, which I'll, I, I often do before I start anything specific towards any given distance that I'm training for. And, and what I mean by that is I'm just trying to get myself to be where I'm running a specific type of pace at that base intensity, which I put at just underneath my aerobic threshold. A lot of people maybe call that zone two. So that's a little bit of the, my guide, in, in other words, of how long I should stay there. I, I like to stay there long enough where I start seeing that pace match spots where I've had it in the past when I would begin the next phase of training. So that all happened pretty quick. It was it was and has been a little different being in Austin because we just deal with very humid and hot summers, whereas the last seven years prior to that, I was in dry heat between California and Arizona. So we got very hot summers, but very much different in terms of the humidity. So that's been a little bit of a transition in terms of kind of trying to match prior data with current data in terms of what it actually means in terms of where I'm actually at. But I did have some opportunities to head out of town and get to some drier areas, including Southern California, and kind of test my fitness in uh, more optimal weather to kind of see where things were at and if I was heading in the right direction. And I, I certainly was. I, I actually did a run over in Southern California, kind of near the end of the base building phase, where uh, I was pushing down pretty low into the sixes, like six zero minute per mile type like paces and was was still sitting right around my aerobic threshold and historically speaking like in just the best of possible situations and circumstances there's been a couple times where i've been able to kind of get that to, to a point where i may be just dipping under six minute miles at that base intensity um for those of you interested that tends to be about 150 155 beats per minute for me so that's kind of that target zone uh for me to kind of operate within when i'm targeting this intensity as kind of the ceiling or don't go past this type of a, a range there. So I was pretty optimistic to see those numbers show up and know that I could, I was at a point where I was trusting my body to introduce some speed work. And from a fitness standpoint, I had the foundation to really go through a speed work development block. Because for me, training for a hundred mile, I'm going to operate under the principle of weaknesses and least specific, least specific stuff early, assuming I have a good foundation. And then I'm going to just get more specific with things as I get closer and closer to the race. So 100 milers being longer and slower, I'm likely to do a speed work development phase a little sooner in the training plan so that I have enough time to get very specific to those slower intensities and race specific type uh, like running when I get within, say, six to eight weeks or so from the race itself. A final aspect to the base training stuff that I did do that was a little different than normal was as I kind of transitioned back to running, I was in this period of time where I could run, but the load was going to be important in terms of easing back into it. So the interesting thing with, with the stress fracture I had on my sacral ala is uphill stuff tended to be less problematic for it. Downhill running and higher impact running tended to be the things I needed to be more careful with. So as I was building back miles and running in the early stages, I did a lot of incline treadmill. My, my move was essentially just turn the treadmill up to 15% and just kind of grind on that in around a zone two capacity. So, uh, you know, a little bit more of a strength running type of an approach and a lower impact. Uh, but that helped me kind of get the volume up in some of those earlier stages without introducing too much impact, but also practicing some 
some stuff that might be useful, a little bit of Havelina. Havelina is not going to have steep climbs by any stretch of the imagination, but they will have some uphill sections. And I think just getting the volume in, in more of a running mechanic than, than the biking or the sled pulling and pushing were able to provide uh, was something that was going to be valuable and something I'll probably actually keep around as I'm building back up into training in the future when I'm coming off of a race or coming off of an off season, things like that. The speed work development block this time around, I focused mostly on short and long intervals. So I kept it quite simple and I kept it quite uh, traditional in the sense that I didn't try to get too creative in the sense like I didn't try to really block workouts where I would do back to back days with uh, speed work or do anything, anything like double threshold sessions or anything like that. I stuck to a more traditional kind of hard, easy, hard type framework where I had a day, sometimes two between harder sessions or you know, even moderate sessions or anything that I would put in speed work. The thing that I maybe did a little different for this 100 miler than I have traditionally is I did a little bit more blending of those two intensities. When I get to a distance that's as far as 100 miles, it's one thing where I'm a little more open to, say, like separating those and doing a phase of short intervals where I'm focusing primarily on just really getting better at that and then transitioning to long intervals and then do a phase where I'm getting better at that and then transition into more race specific type stuff. So I blended those a lot more. I did have a little bit of a phasing out of the short intervals near the end and focused primarily on like the long interval intensity or that threshold intensity, but I didn't do that quite as specifically as I normally would. And part of the reason for that is for me, the workouts that tend to be the most dangerous, I'll say it in terms of a risk reward standpoint are the short intervals. I've historically been someone who can recover and bounce back and rarely get injured from just volume. But if I do pick up an injury, a lot of times it's because of just overloading a little bit on that speed work. And I tend to be a little more sensitive to the short interval sessions. So I have to just be a little more mindful of that and recognize that when I'm going through that phase of training or that specific intensity piece, I should be careful. So I wanted to I wanted to reduce the amount of volume per week I was spending at that intensity for this speed work block just to make sure I didn't get a setback given that historically that's been a little bit more of a risky intensity for me to train. So since I felt ready to do a higher amount of volume of speed work and I did have a little bit of a shorter timeline now if I wanted to have a, a good solid block for long run development, it just made more sense for me to increase the volume uh, of speed work, but not specifically to that higher intensity portion of those short intervals or those VO two max target type intervals. So I did a more traditional setup with that. And I would usually do like one short interval session followed by a longer interval session or some sort of threshold work, uh, and kind of rinse and repeat that a bit. And all in all, I did about eight works, eight weeks total that had a speed work development component to it before kind of transitioning away from that and over towards the long run development. So the way I look at the long run, when it's uh, specific to something long, like a hundred miler, is I actually take that and I sort of like break it into two different types of workouts where I don't look at it as necessarily this long run that I'm building out throughout the entire training plan. I look at it through long run will be embedded into the plan throughout but it's going to be a more traditional type long run for the first part of the training plan or the first oftentimes two thirds of the training plan. And then once I get through that speed work development phase, I start incorporating what I'll consider like almost a different workout altogether. And it's just like an ultra style long run. So the ultra style long run is essentially is what I would consider something that goes beyond what you likely find super valuable in terms of just running adaptations occurring. And you're just getting out there for a longer period of time. And if you're doing it within a more traditional training strategy, like a, tr a traditional endurance training program, there's a good likelihood that if you would do runs that long, they're going to negatively impact things like future speed work sessions or take quality away from a future workout. So I look at this all as kind of like an opportunity cost type of thing. So I like to keep the long runs usually between two to three hours during that main phase of training when I'm doing base building, when I'm doing speed work development. And then once I've confirmed I've got this like historically high to myself 
relative level of running fitness then I can start working on the ultra specific stuff because now the opportunity cost of me taking some of that other stuff off the table in order to make room for things that are going to allow me to practice stuff like race day fueling, something a little bit longer where I can test gear and things like that, do something where the weather's maybe going to shift a little more drastically from the start to the finish. So I just really get better at practicing and reminding myself how I want to go about things on race day and, and get just a little more specific. So I would say for this particular builder for Javelina, I did much less of that. I did a lot more kind of traditional long runs. And part of the reason for that is Javelina is very much a running course. In fact, I've done it twice before. Both times I ran, I ran under 14 hours. The first time I did it was 13 and a half hours. At the time, it was the course record. It's since been broken twice. So um it's a course where I plan to run every step of the way minus the time I spend in aid stations. So it's just the type of run where I find spe specificity is going to be running basically the entire time versus if I were going to do a course that was more mountainous or longer, I would be planning that hiking is going to be a portion of that and something that would be worth practicing, in which case I might stretch out my long run to be a longer duration in order to accommodate the non-running activities that are going to be part of that particular race. So for people who are listening to this and they're curious about, well, how does this translate? If you're doing something like Javelina and your goal is to be out there a bit longer, let's say you're targeting 24 hours, that would be, even though it's the same course I'm training for, that would be a good divergence from what I'm doing to what you'd want to be doing. Because in that case scenario, you're likely doing some hiking if your target is that 24 hour number. So having that component into your long run development during that peaking phase is going to be just something that is worth practicing because it's a tool you're going to use on race day. Um, or if you take it another way, if I did a race where I was targeting that 24 hour time frame uh, on a, on a trail course or something like that, there's a good chance I'd be doing a fair bit of hiking in which case, like I said before, it would behoove me to practice some of that hiking as well. So, it, I didn't do as much of it this time because of the uniqueness of the course and because of the targets that I have for the day. And what that meant is I felt it was going to be more valuable for me to accumulate more overall volume at the intensity I plan on racing. So during my kind of peaking phase, I focused on just getting as much volume as I felt I could kind of put in and recover from at close to a javelina intensity and on terrain that kind of matched that profile as, as well as I could. So the way the javelina loop works is there's five of them. The only difference is the first loop, you have this little extra like two and a half mile add on just because the loop is just under 20 miles and that helps them get to the hundred mile distance with five. But the general kind of theme of that loop is you start out on kind of a flat stretch and then you go up, not super steep, but up towards uh, the midway aid station. And then you have this gradual descent down and then another like kind of flattish roller types area, like back to the finish line. So I, I believe Havelina is like seven or 8,000 feet of total climbing over the course of hundred miles. So I picked, uh, some routes that would be pretty comparable to that level, of uh, to the, to the types of inclines I was going to see at Havelina. So that I was practicing that mechanic and getting kind of used to that. So with that being said, I didn't do a whole lot of really long runs that went much beyond three hours. In fact, three hours was a pretty typical long run, but I did a lot of them. In fact, I had a couple of weeks where I think I did four, four of them total in a week. So the volume was high. The race specificity was high. The really long duration stuff was very limited. I did do one race. I did the Habanero 50K, which is billed as this, this is this kind of like masochistic race where they try to get it as hot as they can. And they start you at like, I think it was like 1230 and it ended up being like 114 degrees and humid that day. So like it was about as miserable as you're going to find, certainly more miserable than I'll see at Javelina, even though Javelina is a warmer weather race, gave me an opportunity to get out there and get on my feet for a little bit longer, practice my, my cooling strategy, my feeling and hydration strategy, a little more specific. And for that race, I was out there for a little over four hours. So I did get a little bit of a longer session time-wise on that one. And, uh, was able to kind of confirm where my mind and body was at relative to kind of the, some of those extreme conditions. And that was enough in my mind to make me confident with being able to extrapolate out to the longer distance stuff at Javelina without having to actually stress some super long stuff in the training, like I would maybe do for 
for a different course or for a different buildup. So just for some ideas of what that maybe looked like, my final kind of build, focusing on goal kind of intensity and terrain for the most part, was this four-week stretch where I went 130 miles, 140 miles, 100 miles, and 150 miles. And that took me up to my taper, which I typically spend about two weeks doing. And within the taper, I'm coming up on this part of it right now. I do take a few really easy days right after that kind of peak week, which for me was that 150-ish mile week. And then uh, I'll I'll do some kind of maybe a, a one or two moderate long runs when I'm about like halfway through that two-week taper and then really kind of cut down and rest as much as needed heading into the race itself. So I'm feeling nice and fresh and that tends to work quite well for me. So, so all in all, I mean, volume throughout the plan was actually pretty solid. Even during the speed work development phase, I was averaging around 110 miles per week, very consistently. And then during the actual pullback from the speed work and volume buildup, I was able to get up to that 150 mile week without too much trouble. In fact, when I finished the 150 mile week, I felt like if the timeline was, was, was longer, I would probably carry on with another week or two and push a little higher volume yet. So I, I kind of like that, that spot. I was, I was in, I would say I was in a similar spot like that in 2015 when I raced the desert solstice track invitational that winter. Uh, I had this really big build up near the end, similar to this one from a volume standpoint. And I got to the end of it and I had that kind of sensation of the first week felt like, okay, this might be tough. But then by the time I got to the last one, it was almost like things were just gradually stressing in the right direction to the point where I was really kind of adjusting to the training as it went along versus feeling like I really was looking forward to that taper, which has me excited to see how things feel on race day and how that all plays out. Uh, a couple things I will share just specific to things outside of the running itself is this was probably the most consistent I was with supplementary activities. I talked about the mobility for the most part with this. I was very consistent with that. I mean, there was probably a, maybe a few days total where I just kind of blew it off altogether and didn't do it. And there was a few days where I didn't do the routine as thoroughly as I would have liked to, but most days I did it start to finish. And in some cases I even did it in terms of like extra where I would do the full routine and then periodically throughout the day, I would do just like different movements within it that I felt like I could make some more progress on with a little bit of extra input in. So that was a, you know, that was amazing to be able to be that consistent with that. And then strength work too. I was just super consistent. I, I, I probably averaged close to two lower body days per week over the course of the plan. And I never had a, a week where I really neglected it. And the, the drills were something I did almost daily. I think I probably missed a day maybe total throughout it. And what I mean by drills is just kind of like basic things that I find to be very useful if I'm consistent with because they keep different ranges of motion and different mechanics kind of more available to me that I maybe aren't stressing when I'm just running as much as I do for these things. So things like forward and sideways leg swings, forward lunges, body weight squats, uh, just like primer type, almost to some degree, uh, dynamic movements that you could do before like a speed workout session or something like that. I was doing those daily for the most part. And in some cases I would do them more than once per day. I would do them before all my lower body sessions. I would oftentimes do them during the day at some point, or if it was a, if it was a morning where I'd wake up and I was just a little more tight than normal, I would do it before the run and things like that. So between mobility, strength work, and the drills, I was really, really consistent with that stuff. And I think that really helped kind of keep the running flow feel good, even though it is an extra time investment. And sometimes, you know, you get to that point where, you know, during the end with that like 150 mile week, I'm spending upwards of 20 hours running. So adding in the strength work, the mobility and the, the drills, it does add up to the point where then I'm getting you know, closer to 25 plus hours per week, um, which, you know, it just takes away from other things you could be doing, I guess, but it was very much worth it. And something that I, uh, that I'm going to take away from this block is something that is probably more or less a, a, a spot that I need to be consistent with, uh, in order to just make sure I stay, stay healthy the way I have this block. And that was kind of a major takeaway for me. Another thing I did to prepare for the Havilene hundred that was, not specific to training, but more about just kind of 
how I want to approach the course is I dug into some of the data that I had from when I raced it in 2016 to 2017, and then also into some of the data for individuals who ran what I would consider really strong races, have won the race in the past, run one, ran course records and things like that. So what I noticed was that for me specifically, like there was a lot of improvement to be made on just better pacing early on. So the interesting thing about Javelina is it is a desert race. So you do have a situation where you start in the morning at six. So it's nice and cool usually in the morning and you do get a couple hours where the, the weather was what I would consider like almost optimal. And then it gets hot. So like the year in 2016, when I ran it, it got up to 102 degrees, which I believe is course record temps. Usually it's more like kind of if you get lucky or it's a cooler year, it's in the low 80s, it's a high, but oftentimes will be in like the low 90s. So there is a lot of uh, change throughout the course of the day between the day and the night where you can have you know, 40, maybe even 50 degree temperature swings between the heat of the day and the coolest parts at night. So for me, if things go well, I won't see cool temps likely in any large capacity until the very, very end but I'll start in them. So what that does mean is you do have this like relative window early on where conditions are just going to be better versus say loop three or loop four, where you might be in the heat of the day and having to deal with that logistics. So I don't necessarily think that you need to be out there in a situation where you're getting progressively faster or your laps are identical from one to the next, but I don't think they should be super drastic. And mine simply were in 16 and 17. I had, uh, too fast in the beginning, specifically the first two laps, and that likely took a fair bit of time off of what I would have been able to do on laps three, four, and five. So specifically this year, one of my big incentives or things I'm going to focus on early on is to hold back a little bit relative to what I did those prior years and make sure that I'm leaving things at a point where I feel like I can be a little more consistent at the end and running stronger. It's the simple thing of like, don't chase 10, 15 seconds per mile early on and then lose one, two minute per mile in certain stretches at the later half. It's just not a good exchange to, to make. So my hope is that that will help me, you know, get to the finish line faster and also feel, feel strong and motivated in those final stretches of the race so that, uh, I can charge hard and, you know, Javelina being a golden ticket race now, and just knowing what the field's like at this point, it's just going to be very competitive. So the likelihood is if I'm having a really good day, there are going to be people around me still. Uh, and there'll be incentive to either try to catch people or to stay ahead of people and things like that. And if, and obviously if I want to get a golden ticket for the Western States 100, I need to finish in the top two or the top two that don't already have a spot. So, uh, I, I anticipate it not being a situation where like there is no reason to run hard at the end. So I want to definitely position myself in a way that I could, be able to uh, run strong at the end of the race. And I think that means proper pacing in the beginning. That's what I got. If you have any follow-up questions about the prep, things like that, I do have some content on Instagram that is specific to this buildup that goes into some more details. If you want to go like along my, my timeline, you'll see I'll have like random like workout stuff on there. I have some stuff that kind of talks about the different training specifics and things like that, as well as some nutrition posts. Um, my mobility routine and my drills routine and things like that on there. So if you're interested in that, head over to my Instagram account, which is at Zach Bitter, Z-A-C-H-B-I-T-T-E-R. And I'll be continuing to post on that leading into Javelina and more so after. My, my, my posting strategy on there right now is I'm trying to be more consistent with that at the end of this year going to next year. And I, I do want to focus on kind of sharing like posts that reflect on my training and then posts that reflect on kind of the education side of why I'm doing or why I think endurance athletes would want to do specific types of inputs, whether that be supplementary activities like strength work, mobility drills, or the actual workouts themselves. And then, uh, do more like posts about like what I'm eating and things like that, because you know, all trainers eat a lot and people tend to be interested in that, I guess. So those have been, those have been some things that people have, uh, said that they enjoy seeing on there. So those are things I'm going to try to be more consistent with going forward on there if you are interested. All right, everyone, if you're still here, you're sticking around to hear about how I use the show sponsor Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. For Element, they make an electrolyte supplement. So what I know about me is that I lose 614 milligrams of electrolytes per liter of fluid loss. So what that means is if I go out for a run and I lose two liters of sweat, then I'm also going to lose roughly 
1,228 milligrams of electrolytes with it, which ironically happens to be about one packet of element. So what I likely will do is if I'm going out for a longer training session or I'm going to be out in the heat and sweating a lot, I'm going to supplement the fluid intake I have with electrolyte to make sure I have that stuff in balance. The way this usually looks for me is I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have a cup of coffee and I'll put half of one of those packets in with my coffee. It will be one of their chocolate flavors though because it's coffee after all. I'm not going to stick one of the fruity flavors in there. So that gets me kicked off. Then what happens is I go out for the workout and then I am drinking basically to thirst, but I am also targeting some numbers at times when it's hot enough and I know what my sweat loss is. But generally speaking, for every liter of fluid I'm taking in, I'm matching that with 614 milligrams of electrolytes to make sure I'm staying on top of that and remaining hydrated throughout that training session. If you're interested in a deep dive and figuring out more about your fluid loss and electrolyte needs, I actually have a couple podcast episodes that might be interesting to you. One is episode 358 with Andy Blow, where I go over all things hydration. And he talks about how I came up with that 614 milligram loss number and how you can maybe find out about yours as well as how much fluid you are losing with some simple at-home tests. Also, I did an episode a while back, episode 300 which is just titled Personalizing Workout Hydration. So check out both of those if you're interested in doing a deep dive into your hydration and electrolyte needs. Something new I added to my training and racing this year are exogenous ketones. The research for exogenous ketones is still in its early stages, but there is a lot coming out and it is getting more convincing in my opinion to the degree where I wanted to try it out. I actually stress tested it during a 15 hour 100 mile run at the Rocky Raccoon 100 earlier this year as a way to confirm whether it was something I was going to include in my racing protocol. One thing I was a little nervous about with exogenous ketones, like I am with anything I'm ingesting during an ultra marathon, is what is it going to do to digestion. I was interested in the recovery research for some time now with exogenous ketones and there are some newer research studies now that suggest it could also have some performance applications as well if you're able to tolerate it and get it in the right dose. So when I decided to try it out, I went with Delta G ketones because they are the ketone ester that basically all the research that has promising effects is tied to and it's their formula that's being used in those research studies. So a lot of times you'll just go and look for an exogenous ketone and there's all sorts of potential issues with that, whether it's a dosage or just the incorrect type and it's not actually gonna do what the research suggests it would do. So to me it was looking at if I want to potentially get the benefits that these could be bringing, I need to be using the one that they're actually showing the research with. So that was Delta G ketones. They actually received the DARPA funding and grants to actually put together that formula. So like I said in the, the intro message, they have 50 plus published studies and are part of 20 plus ongoing studies. My protocol with this right now, and this is something where I am evolving as I kind of do more with it, but at the moment, I'll do a bottle of their ketone performance, Delta G performance, and that is their little blue bottle. So. I'll take one of those about 20 minutes before a big key training session, and that's it. If it's a race day though, I'll do that same protocol, but I will take another bottle about every three hours after that. So if I'm doing something that's longer duration, like that 15 hour Rocky Raccoon effort I just described, I would be doing that again at three, six, nine, and 12 during that particular performance. So like I said in the intro, if you want to chat with one of their experts, you can actually go to deltagketones.com and they have a consultation service there right now where they will help you understand the research and whether your lifestyle is even something that they would, they would be worth considering it for. So if you want to get a little more information on that, that option is available to you. Links to both Delta G ketones and element electrolytes can be found in the show notes as well as at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 